Okay, uh, welcome to a very special one-year anniversary uh, edition of the Adlo Podcast. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. I don't know what you're doing with your life, but I am here. <laughs> I am here with this is. I think this is the most exciting podcast I've done in the one year that I've been doing them. I've had a lot of cool ones, but this is the coolest. Uh, I have here former senior vice president of WCW, WWE Hall of Famer, the host of the 83 Week Podcast, the creator of the NWO, a guy who introduced the Elimination Chamber, wrestled Jay Leno, managed Three Minute Warning, uh, probably one of the most controversial and polarizing figures in pro wrestling history, Eric F. And Bischoff. Eric, how you doing? I'm I'm doing good. I, I I didn't come up with the elimination chamber, however. Oh, that okay. Was Triple H, but I was playing the general manager on TV, so of course I had to take credit for everybody else's idea, which is really common in the wrestling business, by the way. Sure, it does it. So, uh, yeah, I think we got most of those right. Close to yeah, it. close to it. I think yeah. so. Well, and and I got to tell you, so I've heard a lot of different things about you. I think you you can accept that you're, you're probably a, one of the most polarizing figures just because of your role in the Monday Night Wars. But I got to tell you, and I'm not trying to pander in any way, I really don't think you get enough credit. And, and here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> so when I was a kid uh, growing up, you know, I'm born in 81. So, you know, when I was in elementary school, everybody loved all my, all my elementary school friends loved wrestling up until probably Hogan versus Warrior in WrestleMania six. And then there became a time when it was really, you had to keep your fandom quiet. Like you couldn't really go out there and tell everybody you're a wrestling fan. You'd get made fun of. I remember I'd go to wrestling shows. People would come back. I actually was at WCWN censored the first one with Hogan and, and Vader main eventing. And they had, we're going to talk about the renegade by the way. Uh, and, uh, do we and, have to? Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but, I, but, you know, then all of a sudden in high school, the NWO came along and suddenly wrestling was cool. And that you had played a huge role in that. And so I got to tell you, you, the way wrestling is now, I think you play the biggest role in that do how do you feel like if if you were to define your role in pro wrestling what would you think it would be well there's a there's a whole lot of questions yeah (laughs) up in one giant ball right there right let me let me kind of break it down just a little bit what you really described now this is kind of a macro view right this isn't necessarily my own personal view, although it, it is based on my experience just in life and and watching what's happened to the wrestling audience over the course of the last 30 years or so that I've been in the business and the last five or six that I've been out of it. Um, what you've just described is a young child who becomes interested in wrestling, which all of us were at one point, including mm-hmm. me. I remember sitting in front of my television set back in 1962, watching big time wrestling out of CKLW from Windsor, Canada. So we all started out the same way. We were fascinated. We're drawn to the characters. It was larger than life. It was crazy stuff. It wasn't like anything else. It wasn't like watching Gunsmoke. It wasn't like watching the Ed Sullivan show. It wasn't like watching the Brady Bunch, you know, depending on how old you were during that time. So when you're six, seven, eight years old, you first become interested. Then you're 10, 12, 14 years old. You and your buddies are still interested. Then what happens? Puberty. And then what happens? It's girls, it's cars, it's high school. It's an entirely different kind of social life. And you're, the things that appeal to you are now different. You're a different person when you're in your teens than you were when you're 8 or 10 or 12 years old. And you look at wrestling as it follows that arc along with you because you grow up watching it. The larger-than-life characters, the Ultimate Warriors, the Hulk Hogan's, the Andre the Giants, the you know the the very animated larger-than-life characters fit right into your psychographic at that mm-hmm. age. Mm-hmm. And then as you start getting older, you get cooler. Mm-hmm. You're, you want to be cool. You want to be liked. You want to be part of that crowd. You you know those things start mattering to you a lot more than they did when you were eight or nine or ten years old. They were sure. just you and your kids throwing dirt balls at each other. Mm-hmm. things change 
And your tastes also change. Your taste in music changes. Your taste in what you like to watch on television changes. And wrestling's mm -hmm. a part of that. Mm -hmm. And as you get older and you find yourself getting further and further away from the things that entertained you when you were 12, mm -hmm. just, just like called growing up, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you, you, you become distant from wrestling. Mm -hmm. Now, what I did and we did collectively was introduce a different way of presenting wrestling that would appeal to those 18 to 49 year olds. Because at that time, the 18 to 40, 18 to 34, which is the sweet, sweet spot. 18 to 49 right. is the sweet spot. 18 to 34 is a really sweet spot. Mm -hmm. But that entire demographic had been abandoned because the WWE's content as well as WCW's early on was all targeted towards teens and preteens because mm -hmm. that's where the money was. The money in WWE was in licensing and merchandising. WCW tried to be like WWE. So their content was targeted towards teens and preteens primarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. WWE did a great job at it. WCW did a horrible job at it, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, they were both going after the same market in the 18 to 34 and 18 to 49 year old demo. And you were part of that 18 to 34 early on. Um, they were underserved. So that's when I brought in the idea of the NWO in an edgier, more reality-based kind of presentation. Sure. And let Kevin Nash be Kevin Nash instead of Diesel or Oz, which he wasn't <laughs> right. before. Scott Hall didn't come as, you know, Mr. Gillette, Razor Ramon. He came in as Scott Hall because sure. the, that older audience will accept that. It's mm -hmm. not offensive to their psychographic at that stage of their life. It's kind of like, oh, well, this is cool again. Mm -hmm. I have permission to watch this. And I don't, I'm not even embarrassed to talk about it because everybody else is too. Right. Yeah. Well, that and that's long winded brother. <laughs> that's, no, but that's, that's good. That's okay. This is what I want to hear, you know, it, it, but so that, that part though, when, when, cause I remember watching, it's interesting cause I, I don't know what happened, but I, I missed Hogan turning, but I remember seeing Scott Hall appear on WCW the first time, and I was so excited. Like everybody else, I was like, oh man, WWF and WCW have finally gotten together, right? So w was it always the plan to just call him Scott Hall, or was it even a plan when he showed up with regard to that? It was both, actually. There was a, there was a plan. There had been... Have you ever built a house from scratch? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. I, I don't mean you personally, but I mean, yeah. have you ever hired a contractor to build a house for you? No, no. I okay. So there's stages in that, right? Mm -hmm. There's steps mm -hmm. before the house becomes a house and you can have a holiday party, Christmas party, birthday party, whatever. Um, and, and invite friends and family over You you've got to start somewhere Well, you start with a sketch. Mm hmm that you sit down and you bring to an architect. So mm -hmm. you have a, a sketch is just your, your best version of what you see in your mind on paper. So mm -hmm. that when you go in and talk to an architect or a builder, you can sit down with that basic design and say, I want the living room to be, you know, this size. I want the kitchen to be the biggest room in the house, but you know what, blah, 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 blah. You you're giving them what you want to see in your house on a piece of paper. And then it goes into an architect and then it becomes a more finely detailed plan that allows the builder to come in and start slapping up two by fours and put a roof on the damn thing. Sure. So that's kind of like the, the steps in building a house. Well, the steps in building the NWO were much the same. Mm. And here are the analogies I'll make, you know, compared to a builder or, mm -hmm. or somebody that has an idea for a house. I had the idea from the house in my head for a couple of years. And when I say the idea, not that necessarily how it would work, but an idea of what WCW needed, mm -hmm. an idea, a, a realization that we had to go after that 18 to 34, 18 to 49 year old demographic. That's what mm -hmm. we had to do. I couldn't compete with WWE. I couldn't be better than them at going after teens and preteens. They have that market all locked up. There's no reason to mm -hmm. fight that fight. Sure. They've already won that. I'm not mm -hmm. going to fight a fight I can't win. But over here, there's this giant bucket of bucks over here, and nobody's even knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go get that. 
So I knew I needed to do it. And I, and I had been to Japan often enough to really um, appreciate the difference between the American version of professional wrestling presentation, which is over the top Hulk Hogan, ultimate warrior, Andre the Giant, larger than life, larger than life, almost cartoonish to a large degree. Mm -hmm. You know, IRS, the garbage man, the crazy dentist, all that stuff, you know, right. Undertaker, right. very animated character, very successful, but very animated. <laughs> so I couldn't do that. So I had to go after this other, I, other market. And I knew that. So I'm thinking about ways of doing it and presenting WCW much the same as what I saw in Japan, meaning it was presented to be much more realistic and believable. Mm -hmm. That's what the Japanese really did differently than the American audience is they treated it very respectfully. That's part of that goes to the culture and the way it's treated in the media and things like that. But it was believable. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mm -hmm. as flamboyant. It wasn't as over the top. There was some very colorful characters and mass characters and things like that, but there was, they were rare, which is why they were special mm -hmm. for the most part. 70% of the presentation was very straight up sports, like legitimate and, and hard hitting and believable. So I was trying to figure out a way to do what I saw in Japan here in the United States and kind of merge the psychology of those two presentations. So Scott Hall became available. He decided he wanted to leave WWE. He called a close friend of mine, Diamond Dallas Page. Um, we were mutual friends. He called Diamond Dallas Page. I talked to Scott. I hired Scott. A week later, I could hire Kevin. That's when I went, wait a minute. Now, this idea that's been bouncing around loosely in my head, I'm going to sketch it out on a piece of paper so I can give it to the architect. Mm. And I had the sketch, the piece of paper, pretty well laid out from a psychology point of view, from, from a, a vibe, mm -hmm. how I wanted it to feel and look. I wanted it to be edgy, a little dangerous. Give me a little bit of uh, renegade mixed in there. <laughs> That's what I want. Uh -huh. and I want it to be believable. So when Scott was available, then Kevin's available. And I went, wait a minute. Both of these guys worked previously in WCW. Both of them felt like they didn't, and I know this because I was an announcer there at the time. They both mm -hmm. left WCW and went to WWE because they didn't think they were ever going to get an opportunity in WCW. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought that they were good enough for an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they go to WWE, they become big stars, and now they're going to come back and exact revenge. That is a very basic story. That's like one of the seven basic stories in the history of mankind. Right. It's revenge. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's just a revenge plot. So yeah. it's a very simple story technically at its core, but because of the unique timing and people just being available, it like all came together very, very quickly. And once I got done with the paper sketch, then we were literally figuring it out as we went. Wow. And when did true. when did Hogan come in to the picture of that? Mm. I'm going to try to make these stories short because we'll be here all night. Right. But I had originally, once I got past the paper part, like when mm -hmm. I had actually on a piece of paper and I could look at it and go, okay, this is how this is going to work. Like, you know, a recipe. You're going to mm -hmm. smoke a brisket. You want to make sure you do everything right, you know, in the right order. Right. So I had it pretty well sketched out on a piece of paper. And I thought, okay, I need that third man, what ultimately became Hulk Hogan. I need somebody that's going to shock the wrestling audience. Nobody's ever going to suspect so that when this baby face uh, or good guy, um, <clears throat> excuse me, turns bad guy or heel, it's going to have a devastating impact. Well, the only person that fit that bill was Sting mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. that time. So I, and I was very close to Sting at the time. We were very good friends. So I went to sing and I laid this whole thing out. He's very reluctant in the beginning he's, mm -hmm. because he's just a very cautious guy. He's very smart, very pragmatic, very cautious. So he was getting, I don't know, you know, let me think about that. Let me talk to my wife. You know, let me look at the Ouija board, whatever. You know, whatever guys <laughs> right. I don't know. And, and we talked about it again about a, two or three days later. And he was like warming up to the idea. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, how would this work? You know, and once I, once he started asking those questions, I knew I had them. How, what, yeah, but do you think this? And I, I had an answer for everything, mostly because I'm a good salesman, not because I actually had an answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then by the third call, he was like all in. And now mm -hmm. he's excited about it. 
Mm. You know, so it went from, oh, I don't know, to, well, how does that work, to, I can't wait. Mm. So once I got him to the I can't wait stage, that's my man. That's mm. where I'm going. Mm -hmm. I'm filling in the little piece of paper just a little bit more. I'm starting to shade in some stuff, put a little tree on the outside. So really get an idea what it looks like. Right. <laughs> right. And then I get a phone call from Hulk. Now Hulk had been off in California doing it because Hulk only, we only had four dates a year with Hulk mm -hmm. and we broke it up, you know, one in the winter, one in the spring, one in the summer, one in the fall. Right. So we had, you know, long periods of time without Hulk. So during one of those long periods of time without Hulk, which was part of his schedule, he went off and was doing a movie. Mm -hmm. This was right about the same time Kevin Nash showed up. Mm -hmm. Now, Jimmy Hart was sending Hulk FedEx overnight to California because Hulk was locked out on a movie set. Mm -hmm. And Hulk's watching on videotape. He's seeing this and he's going, oh, wow. Oh, this is looking pretty good. I like this. <laughs> Scott Hall coming through the crowd. Kevin Nash te teasing who's the third guy. That's right when I got that phone call from Hulk, like probably the next day or two days after that show aired, where Kevin teased our, our, our third guy. So I get a call from Hulk. Hulk says, look, brother, I can't leave the movie set. I'm locked down. We're filming every day. And then we're way outside of L.A., up in the mountains. And uh, he said, can you come out so we can kind of, talk about the rest of the year. I had time. So I jumped on a plane, flew out to LA, it took about four hours to get to the movie set. Cause it was way up in the mountains. Like up to, I got to LA, I was wearing a t-shirt. By the time I got up into the mountains, I was looking for my North face parka. It was <laughs> brutal. So I get up there and about 11, 1130 at night, I finally get to the set and Hulk's still up. He's waiting for me. So I go mm. to his movie trailer and he's got a 12 pack of beer on ice there and he's got a little box of Cuban cigars and he's sitting back and he's waiting for me. He knew I was coming in through the door. So I sat down, we made some small talk and he finally leans forward, puts the cigar down, leans forward and says, so brother, who's the third man? Hmm. And I didn't want to tell him because hmm. I, up until that point, I kept it absolutely no one knew Kevin, uh, Kevin Nash didn't know. Kevin Sullivan, my booker at that point, didn't even know. Scott mm. Hall didn't know. My wife didn't know. <laughs> I would, I didn't tell anybody. So I, and I didn't want to tell Hulk, not because I thought he would go run around and tell everybody, but sometimes just in your excitement, I've done it. Mm -hmm. you know, somebody mm -hmm. tell me something exciting in confidence, you know, that, but they want to keep it a surprise. And in my excitement, I'll blurt it out at the exact wrong time. Sure. Not, sure. Not, 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 malicious it just happens so i i didn't want to tell anybody because i really felt that the power in that idea was keeping it a secret that's right. what, the shock value mattered a lot mm -hmm. so i i'm you know i'm thinking oh now what do i say he just asked me who's the third man i didn't want to tell him sting mm -hmm. so i i went huh. who do you think it should be <laughs> <laughs> answer a question with a question right right, right. yeah and he was Hey brother, you're looking at him. Like, oh, that's all. Cause that was, I knew as soon as he said that, I knew he was going to do it. I figured that's why he was, when he called me up there and he had the beer waiting and a box of Cuban cigars, he was doing the pitching and I was doing the buy-in. So I went, eh. yeah. but I, I was, I almost lost my breath because I, I knew it would be, I don't know, fairness. Did I think it would become as big as it did? Absolutely not. Not going to lie about that. It, it's still a phenomenon to this day. It's number one. The NWO yeah. t-shirts is still one of the top 10 sellers in the WWE merchandise catalog 25 years later. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It was big, Man. but I didn't see it. But when, when he told me, Hey, I'm, I'm your third guy. I was excited. And then I got on a plane on the way I'm flying home. I'm thinking, <laughs> what am I going to tell Sting? Sting excited about <laughs> yeah. it. But still, he, he, he was a good friend. He still is a good friend. He's a good man. He's a good human being. He's a good father. He's a good Christian. And I just told him the truth. I, yeah. I didn't want to try to sugarcoat it or spin it or do the corporate gimmick. I just said, Steve, his name's Steve Borden. I said, Steve, here's, here's the cards. I'm going to lay them on a table. What would you do? Yeah. Yeah. And he was good with it. And he, and by the way, to his credit, this is how much of a pro Steve Borden was, is 
Because at 63 years old, he's still flying off the top of the ring rope and breaking through tables unbelievably. Uh-huh. But I was not 100% sure that Hulk would actually follow through until an hour before he was scheduled to go through the curtain. Wow. Because Hulk had a, he had the ability contractually and he had the tendency under the right circumstances or the worst circumstances, maybe a better way to say it, to do a complete 180. And -hmm. I knew that. Mm -hmm. And I had to prepare for that. I, I couldn't go into that scenario knowing what I knew and not have a plan B. Mm. That would be stupid. So I went to Steve and I said, Steve, thank you for jumping in. I'm sorry you got so excited about something you're not going to be able to do. But I need one more favor, brother. I need you to be ready just in case Hulk changes his mind at the last minute. That's a giant freaking ask. Yeah. Yeah. As a as a performer, as a friend, as a just a human being with a little bit of dignity, that is a horrible ask. And he looked at me and said, just let me know. Man. That's what kind of guy Steve Borden is, by the way. You know, let me let me ask you to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask you, because I've read about your story, and it's really your rise in wrestling is really surprising. I mean, yeah, it, there's been lots of guys before you. And lots of guys after you who have tried to compete with the WWE. And for my listeners who don't know anything about wrestling, this would be akin to a a new football, you know, a a new football league getting there and trying to fight against the NFL and actually beating them. And you rose from being basically a C-show announcer to being this the senior vice president over guys like Jim Ross, Tony Schiavone. What do you think you you possess? Like what? if there was a character trait that made you successful and made you be able to, to get this buy-in, what do you think you have that maybe some other people don't? So much of, of success and failure is, is the foundation is in timing. Mm -hmm. And, and I had some unique timing and Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross had some uniquely bad timing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I was a better choice I was a different choice than either of them because neither of them are anything like I am, um, which is maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a, maybe for their sake, it's a good thing. But, you know, I came into WCW in 1990, whatever it was, 1991 initially, moved, moved to Atlanta in 92, became kind of a fixture, more or less a permanent fixture, so to speak, um, in WCW in 92. But I was just the announcer. I, I nobody nobody had a strong. I was the outsider who came in to do the stuff that nobody else wanted to do on camera. Mm-hmm. I was the least threatening person in the building, <laughs> probably. Right, at least one of them. So a lot of people got very comfortable around, around. Not not that everybody liked me by any stretch of the imagination. There were a lot of people I just didn't have any relationship with, good or bad. I had I the people that I worked with. I was very friendly with and got along with. But for the most part, I was kind of like a non-entity. Mm-hmm. Just showed up and did TV. And then when I got down there and got more integrated just because I was there and I got invited to more meetings, really, mm-hmm. um, I started speaking up more in small group meetings or in some case in research environments. Mm-hmm. And people heard that, you know, and I, I started learning more and paying attention to more. And You know, I came to WCW. I taught myself. Well, I didn't teach myself, but I... I you know, I learned production in my spare time because I was fascinated with how it all worked. Mm-hmm. I went into AWA as a salesperson, you know, mm-hmm. because I was fascinated with TV. I want to know how it works. So I sat in on edit sessions. I learned how to edit a television show. I knew how to put it together and put it in the box and send it off to a TV station so that he put it on TV. I did all that stuff. I promoted live events on a very, very small scale. I ended up on camera in the AWA. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was like a jack of all trades. I sold ad sales and syndication. So there was so many aspects of the wrestling business that I was familiar with. Not good at, but mm-hmm. I kind of done it all, or at least was exposed to it at a pretty interesting level. Not, mm-hmm. a, not a large scale, but large enough to matter, right? Mm-hmm. I put together $100,000 sponsorships with one of the largest regional brewing companies for Vern Gagne and the AWA back in 1988. 
was nothing like that had ever been done before. Sure. So I was leaning into the entrepreneurial side of my personality and my character more and more and more. So that eventually when WCW decided that they wanted to, when Turner decided they wanted WCW to quit being so much of a wrestling company and be more of a television company of all the people that were there in house to choose from everybody else. And this is where the timing comes in. Like Jim Ross was tight with Bill Watts who got mm -hmm. fired, which is what created my opportunity. Well, when Bill Watts got fired, Jim Ross kind of got, he was like the baby in the bathwater. Yeah. Out you go. Tony was a, recognized as, you know, just one of those old wrestling guys. And Ted Turner had made up his mind. He didn't want to go the wrestling guy way to lead that company. He wanted somebody with more of an entrepreneurial or a bigger vision, different vision. Mm -hmm. And I probably fit that bill at that time more than Jim Ross or Tony Schiavone, just mm -hmm. because of what they were looking for in that moment. Yeah. So I got to tell you, so just a little bit about me. I, I've run an, an indie promotion that did charitable events around Northern California. And I got to tell you, you know, it's amazing to me just with indie guys who have never been to the WWE and the AEW or any of those things, uh, the egos that you deal with. And, and I got to imagine being at the escalon, you know, the, the top echelon of, wrestling the egos that you're dealing with and you're coming in as a guy who was the announcer who's now the senior vice president tell me that had to have been a little intimidating even if you didn't show it did you have to do anything uh to kind of get everybody in line with your vision uh no and you know what's funny is and, and this is you know I, again i was blessed because having been that guy that was the fly on the wall and not threatening and just, you know, he's, he's that Northern guy, you know, cause it was a South, right? So anybody that was from the North was like, Oh, I don't know if we want to trust this guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it, it's a real thing, or at least it used to be. Um, but I was able, cause I was in WCW for a couple of years before I got in the management. So I was able to develop some pretty good relationships mm -hmm. and I've always been good at that. You know, I find mm -hmm. people interesting especially if people are, are are involved in something that I have no knowledge or, or understanding of. Like, I want to pick mm -hmm. their brains. Mm -hmm. So I spent time down in the post-production studio with Keith Mitchell, who was the head of mm -hmm. production services mm -hmm. at the time. And mm -hmm. through Keith, I got to learn a lot while I was mm -hmm. an announcer in WCW, and I developed a great relationship. Craig Leathers, who ultimately became my director, same thing. I wanted mm -hmm. to learn how he directed a show and what his – technique was compared to other people's I had worked with. Mm -hmm. So when you start asking questions because you're curious and developing relationships and all of a sudden one day you find yourself in management, yes, there were some people as would be the case in any merger or acquisition. There are some people that are going to feel like, why him and not me? Mm -hmm. Or he mm -hmm. doesn't deserve that. I've been here for 10 years and I don't have that opportunity. He's been here for 18 months and now he's this? That's yeah. just human nature, you know, in, mm -hmm. in any company. Did that exist? Sure. Was it a problem? Not really. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to come in and lay down the law or pro proclaim myself king or any of that kind of thing. That's just not my nature. But I asserted myself. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody was in any doubt as to whether or not I thought I was in charge. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in some ways, I think I did that in some ways I did that very well. And in other ways I didn't. Yeah. Looking back, I could have done things way better and with more maturity and experience, but I was learning on the job, brother. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to imagine too. I mean, that that's a big, I mean, you're taking on the WWE and you got this thing that blows up as fast as the NWO did. And, and yeah, you, there's gotta be a level of that. You're flying by the seat of your pants, trying to figure it out as you go. And, and now you, know you that, that, that's the nature of TV, though. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you're producing, whether you're producing wrestling or sitcoms or action or whatever. And if you look at television, you watch closely television. I, and I've been watching more and more and more closely at, at the way things I really like are being produced and written. Mm -hmm. Television is changing every single day. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it wasn't as hard as probably would you would think it would be from the outside. Hmm. Was there was there a moment 
can you think of a moment like I, I got to imagine there were scramble moments, you know, when oh, you're yeah, doing every, live that's TV. Live TV. Yeah. Can you're you think TV, man? Everything goes wrong in live TV. <laughs> I had the power go out in the middle of a broadcast. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do, what do you think is like your is there something that sticks out as like the craziest scramble moment you had when you were running WCW? Well, it was, uh, you know, I, this is so embarrassing because I know, you know, wrestling fans love information and they memorize things and they have things in their head that I forgot even happened, even though I was involved in it. Um, but there was a pay-per-view and I can't remember exactly which pay-per-view and what the finish was, but we went over time. When mm. you do a pay-per-view, you, you contract with direct TV and mm -hmm. dish and all these different, you know, satellite providers and just, you know, uh, pay-per-view providers, you're going into a contract them for X amount of satellite time. Mm. And once you hit that clock, it goes off the satellite. Mm. We had a, a series of screw ups on a live broadcast, which put us about 10 or 15 minutes over. And the people that bought the pay-per-view that spent $39.95 or $49.95 for whatever it was at the time. And there were a lot of them. Um, they didn't see the finish to the main event. Yeah, that was Goldberg versus Diamond Dallas Page. I remember, uh, that. I remember that. And, you know, I got to tell you, because I didn't get that. We, we didn't have a lot of money back then, and so we didn't get every pay-per-view. I was grateful because I got to watch it on Nitro the next day. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you were one of the – for every one of you, there was 15 that weren't. Yeah, I'm sure you got some strongly worded letters on oh, that. Oh my gosh. And I knew it. You know, I knew when we left the building, you know, when I finally got word none, none of that happened. Nobody saw it on, on pay-per-view. I went, oh my gosh. Now what yeah. I do. And of course, my boss at the time, Harvey Schiller, and I he was president of TBS Sports. I really, really enjoyed working with Harvey. I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. But he hardly ever bothered me. Mm. It's probably why I write, like him so much. <laughs> he pretty much <laughs> left me to either succeed or fail on my own. He would guide me mm. along when he saw me going off the rails a little bit. But for the most part, he was very much of a macro manager. Mm. And I, I love that about him, mm. as well as Ted. Um, but when he called me that night, now we're talking about 1130 Eastern time. Mm. And I'm getting a call from Harvey Schiller. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be good. <laughs> and it wasn't. <laughs> And what are you going to do? And at that point, I didn't know. I hadn't ever ex experienced it. I'd never been a part of anybody else's production that experienced it. I didn't fully comprehend what my options were, either logistically or creatively. I was like trying to boil that all together and come up with a stew in my head. And by the time Harvey called me, I hadn't finished finding out the ingredients yet. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. I just told him the truth. I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out by morning. Yeah. I'll call you. And you know, honestly, that's what I said, and that's what I did. Well, you know, and that's an interesting that's an interesting one to bring up because that I wanted to also highlight that. Sometimes uh, I hear from other wrestling fans, they say silly things like, well, you know, WCW never created any, you know, any stars, you know, really. WWE was good at that. And I just go, well, what are you talking about? That pay-per-view is a perfect example. You had Goldberg and Diamond Dallas Page, WCW grown, you know, homegrown talent, you know, creating, you know, main eventing a pay-per-view or, or Booker T or Buff Bagwell or or Scott Steiner. I mean, all or these Chris guys. Chris Jericho or Rey Mysterio or, yeah. or, or, I mean, yeah, there's been a few that have come through there. And let's, let's be honest about it, though. You know, Chris Jericho had been wrestling for a while before I found him. And Paul Heyman actually used Chris Jericho to ECW before I brought him in. But guess what? Nobody freaking knew about it because it was the tree that fell in the forest and nobody was around to see it or hear it fall. Right. You know, right. ECW was, you know, was, yeah, it existed, but in, in terms of viewing audience, it really didn't. It had mm -hmm. a cult following on the East coast in certain pockets of the East coast, yeah. but as a national promotion, no, it wasn't yeah. a national platform. We did. You know, the cruiserweights and, and so much of the stuff that I think we created. Uh, I, I think if one of the questions you asked me earlier about how I think people look at my history or whatever. I mean, if you here's what I'm the most proud of. It's really this. And, and I really don't care if people recognize it or not, because I know what I did. And mm -hmm. at this point in my life, that's really all that matters <laughs> to yeah. me when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. But. When I created Nitro, I brought the reality wrestling format 
to the to the to a national platform for the very first time. When I when I let Scott Hall beat Scott Hall and let Kevin Nash beat Kevin Nash and went with that reality based storyline, that changed the wrestling business forever. Yeah, it forced the WWE WWE to change to go from the teen and preteen product that they were to following the pattern that I created with Nitro in being more of an 18 to 34 year old, 18 to 39, 49 year old product. That's why the over the top sexuality and the, all the crazy stuff attitude era only existed as a reaction to what I was doing on Nitro with the NWO. I know that I can yeah. look at the timeline. I can, I can see the beats along the way in both shows that forced WWE to go. All right. We're wrong. He's right. Let's do what he's doing, but let's do it bigger and better. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. I and you know, it's, it's, it's funny you bring that up because in my, in my work, sometimes as a, as an attorney, as a trial attorney, sometimes my clients, they don't understand what I've done for them, you know, and you have to be willing to just accept that, you know, what you did for them. And it, in these, in as a fan, I don't know what went on week to week behind the scenes, you do, you know, you, you gotta, you know, like you said, I think a lot of people have to be just know internally that what they're doing mattered. And it, you know, it's, it's a really interesting analogy though. And I, by the way, I didn't know you were a trial attorney. I'll, I'll, I'll get your number when we're done. <laughs> you never know when I'm going to need one. <laughs> I live on the edge. <laughs> but you know, when you're dealing with a client, and I'm assuming a lot of things here, but bear with me just to make an sure. example, I guess, a point, context. But when you're dealing with a client, I would guess nine mm -hmm. or 9.99 times out of 100, you're dealing with someone that's working from a position of emotion. Oh, yeah. What am oh, I yeah. going to gain? What am I going to lose? How am I going to win? How am I going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. What's going to happen? Am I going to go to jail? Or am yeah. I going to be publicly embarrassed? All the things that can go wrong if you're on the wrong end of litigation, your clients are thinking about either winning or losing, and that's all emotion. Yeah. They have no bandwidth to try to figure out or even appreciate how you're helping them. They right. can't understand that because that's – that's now that takes thinking. That's analysis. That's critical mm -hmm. thinking. And anytime you have critical thinking and emotion – Going head to head, emotion is going to win every single time. Yeah, it just yeah. does. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, you you look at the news. That's how the news is formatted today. Oh, nobody's giving 100%. you information. Nobody's nobody's laying out facts and allowing you to think through and develop an opinion of your own. They're telling you from the get go, out of the gate. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a conservative. If you're wherever you get your news, you have to be very careful that you're not just being forced fed shit. That creates emotion, and mm -hmm. absolutely wipes out any critical thinking. Yeah, and I I tell my clients that all the time when I'm giving them bad news, you know, I or about their case, and I just tell them I go, you hire me because I understand this is an emotional subject for you. I'm here to tell you the risks. Of moving forward so that you can make an informed decision and sometimes they don't like that and you well, know what they really want is for you to make the decision for them and if it turns out great yay you're oh, a great guy yeah. and if it turns out bad yeah i'm coming after you yeah and i and i never do i never give them i always tell them the same thing I go, you have to own this decision because 10 years from now i'm going to have 100 other cases i'm going to i'm not going to be thinking about yours but you will so i want you you know i want you to 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 own this decision sometimes they don't like that um Going back to you, I wanted to ask something you said earlier. You said some of the things you handled, you didn't handle in your best self. And, you know, you have the now you have the time of you, you, you're getting a little bit out from when you were. I mean, that, that attitude error, I can't believe it was over 20 years ago, 25 years ago that this was all going on. Is there anything as you look back, you look back and you go, I wish I would have handled that a little differently? Oh, or, yeah, every day. I mean, I don't think about it every day, but. If I thought about it every day, I can think of a 10 things that I wish I could have handled differently. And, and it's not always big things. Uh -huh. You know, I don't I don't feel bad or embarrassed or disappointed in any of my decisions. Because mm -hmm. I learned from every one of them. Yeah, that's I, true. And I learned a lot less from the good ones than I did from the bad ones. So in a weird kind of twisted, tormented way, like an artist, like whoever it was, Van Gogh, cough his ear, whatever it was. I almost kind of feel the same way about failures because if something that I'm passionate about doesn't work, I, you know, I'll, I'll go through my, you know, phase for a day or two 
And then I dig in and try to figure out why, how did I let myself, how did I convince myself that this was such a great idea when it wasn't? Yeah. And I look for those weak spots, those flaws yeah. in the process because everything's a process for me. So I go, okay, oh, I could have done that differently. I could have analyzed this bit of information differently. Or sometimes it's just my instinct. Sometimes sure. I override my own instinct. Actually, damn. <laughs> That's the worst because then I don't. (laughs) And and then you realize your instinct was right all along. Yeah, like, oh, why didn't I listen to myself? Yeah, so frustrating. I was actually teaching a class uh, on Sunday, a a church class, and we were talking about trials and difficulties and stuff. And and I and I was saying to the class, I just said, I was like, I don't understand why God made it the way where you you have to fail and you have to have these difficulties to really learn and become a a, the better person. And I'm the same way. I've had a, a few failures, big ones in my life. But those things have led to better things in the future. And it's like, I hate that that's the way it is, but that tends to be the way life is. You know, we make these mistakes and we learn, unfortunately, we learn more from them than our successes. And it sounds like the same thing happened for you. Mm, man, I'm such a believer in that. And, you know, when, when people say, well, why would God let that happen? You know, And I found myself, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, but mm-hmm. I've, I've been a better Christian at other times in my life than I have, you know, in others. <laughs> right. And, and it's all just depends how much I want to invest in it and how much time I put into it. You know? Yeah. God's there. Christ is there. You're not going anywhere. Right. It's whether or not I want to take a you know vacation or not, you know, and I yeah. find myself the more vacations I take, the more miserable I am. Oh, so I'm, I'm leaning more and more into no more vacations. I'm good, you know, because yeah. I'm actually happier being yeah. closer it's- to my faith than I am not being close to my faith. That's so true. And you know, the funny thing is, is you mentioned those instincts. Sometimes I think those are, you know, that's God telling you something. And I've, I have through sad experience, I've learned that if you're not doing what God's telling you to do, he'll compel you to. <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> and it's not, you know, not to get too heavy, but I don't, I, I just think, well, for me, my relationship with God, with Christ is just a process of opening up my mind and listening Hmm. And I've never felt like, oh, I'm being punished for this, or God's going to put this in my way, you know, like it's like it's an obstacle course. I just feel like the the more distance I get, and the, the less relationship I have, you know, for me now it's throughout the day. I'll say yeah. the Lord's prayer probably eight or ten or twelve times a day. Yeah, I'll be driving down the road and say the Lord's prayer, you know, just because I feel myself drifting away. Hmm. You know, it kind of brings me back. You know, it makes me yeah more aligned. But for me, it's always been, no, it's just when you start, it's like drifting off the road when I'm driving. If I'm not paying attention, I'm, you know, talking on my phone, looking down, I'm petting my dog and I drive off the road. It's because I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. I wasn't focusing. And the more I focus on my relationship, and that's just a little bit of communication here and there, thinking about God and thinking about Christ, I, I find myself right back going straight down the highway. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how when, you know, if you have faith and you're following it, how much, even even the hard times just seem to be a little bit easier, you know? And, um, you know, one of the things I actually wanted to ask you about, because this is really interesting, you hear so many stories, you, you've been married to your wife since like 1984, right? Mm-hmm. And so many people in the wrestling business, I mean, you're traveling so much, and, and I, it might be a little bit different for you, but I can't imagine it was much different for you than some of the wrestlers. You know, how was it that you were able to maintain that relationship when so many other people in the business weren't? I have no idea. I have no, no. I mean, I, I only know my life. Yeah. And it's hard to say, well, how could you do it when so many other people didn't? Because I'm not in their shoes. Sure. They're not in my shoes. Sure. Their worlds are so much different than my worlds that for me to say, well, this is how I did it. And if they would have done it this way, it would have worked. Sure. All I'm saying is... Um, I got lucky. Timing is yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. I got really lucky. And when I say that, I mean, I'm married to a very, very beautiful woman. She was a model when I met her and she's still beautiful to this day, but she's way more beautiful on the inside than she is on the out. And she's a very patient person. And she's, yeah. a, she's always been in a very enlightened person. Mm. And for whatever reason, she was attracted to me, which is, kind of hard to figure out at this point it just worked 
I had, there were certain aspects of my personality, probably the fact that I was an entrepreneur and I was willing to take risks and she was probably less willing. So mm -hmm. sometimes that's kind of a great fit is yeah. you want somebody that's willing to kind of take you outside of your comfort zone, not over the cliff and into a fire, but just enough to the edge of the cliff that you feel like your life's got more value or more depth. Yeah. So it was just a good fit. And I, here's, here's what we did early on. Um, even when we had no money, even when we shouldn't have done it by any stretch of the magic imagination or metric, every Friday night, we had a date night, um, even when we had kids, even when yeah. we were broke, mm -hmm. if it meant going somewhere and having two beers and a bowl of French fries, then that was the night, but we mm -hmm. went out every Friday night. So you kept that part of your relationship where yes, now your parents, you're still lovers, but more your parents, you know, by yeah. the way you're working and oh, hey, let's throw a dose of anxiety on top of it because you're kind of broke and yeah. you're not sure how you're going to fix that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, for us, we felt it was really valuable to carve out four hours on a Friday night and date yeah. and forget all that stuff. Not, not in a bad way necessarily, but Although once in a while, but <laughs> you know, to go out and have a nice dinner, have a couple drinks, go visit some friends, you know, whatever, just get out of the environment and relax. We put a high, very high value on that. Yeah. And that I think was really important. Yeah. You know, I, I like that what you said though, about the entrepreneur versus not so much, because I feel like you, you probably, I would imagine when you get into an entrepreneurial idea and you get an idea, you are a gung ho and you, having somebody there to kind of, well, let's think this through kind of probably gave you a better idea of, of how to think it through too. Yeah. And that's what I, the way I described our relationship could potentially be a little misleading because my wife is also an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. first met when she was a, she had been modeling since she was five years old in Minneapolis. In fact, one of her first commercial gigs, she was on the cover of a can of Play-Doh when she was five years old. <laughs> if you even know what Play-Doh is. Oh, I do. You don't. <laughs> and, and she was a, a, a model as a child model and she grew up as a teen model and then she got into fashion. So she, she was out there and, and her and one of her best friends started a modeling agency when she was like 21 years old. So it's not that she wasn't an entrepreneur, but she was a way, she was very much more pragmatic. Mm. I was like, Hey, I have an idea here like this, set me on fire. I'm taking off and didn't check the fuel. Right. I wasn't exactly sure where I was going to land. But once I got excited about something, I was off. Yeah. That was the difference in our personalities. Mm. And, and that's, that's awesome. You know, another thing I wanted to ask you about with family because like me, this is something that, that I made. I, I actually trained to be a pro wrestler here in California uh, when I was 18. And then I served a mission for my church. And when I came back when I was 21, you know, I just kind of decided this is like 2002. I just said, you know, I don't want to be away from home that much. I'd like to be there when my, you know, I, I'd heard some stories from other wrestlers who, you know, they were touring all the time. And I just didn't want to do that. You had that life. Did you at times, because your kids were probably pretty young when you were dealing, you know, going through all this, uh, did you ever have moments where you felt like you were missing out or how did you deal with no, that? No, because I, I was, I, I, I was pretty lucky mm -hmm. because I, I wasn't a wrestler. So, I, you know, when, when wrestlers talk about their travel schedule and it's one of the most mind boggling things that one could try to experience and try to get through for more than six months or a year, um, it is the most difficult aspect of being a high level professional wrestler is not what you do in the ring. It's what it takes to do what you do in the ring 365 mm -hmm. days a year. It's, it's nonstop. It's, it's, it's a time and a half or double time job yeah. between the travel, your conditioning, your personal appearances, your performances. It's unbelievable. Mike, I didn't live that. I lived a different version of that 
because while I was working 10, 12 hours a day in the office, I was doing a lot of business outside of Atlanta. I was traveling to Los Angeles a lot. I was going, you know, I was traveling with the shows every Monday night, eventually every Thursday night. And in between Monday and Thursday, I was traveling to LA to meet Hulk Hogan in a mountain somewhere. I mean, <laughs> I, I traveled a lot, but I was home two or three nights a week, mm -hmm. sometimes late, but mm -hmm. I was home. And I got to take my kids to work a lot. Mm -hmm. Like when we would shoot shows down at the Disney MGM studios, we go down and we'd shoot 13 weeks of TV over the course of eight days, mm -hmm. five days. Mm -hmm. But we go down, we get a hotel room at Disney MGM studios and my kids get to come and I'd let my kids bring their neighborhood friends. And we'd just spend a week in Disney. Yeah. And because my kids got to be a part of what I did. I took my kid, both of my son and my daughter, I took them to Japan on a trip, a business trip that I was on. And mm -hmm. they got to experience being in Japan at, at the highest level. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Japanese onsens, which are like these mineral hot springs of way up in the mountains where the, 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 the um, shoguns would all, you know, bathe in the mineral hot springs. You know, my kids got to experience so much stuff with me. So, mm -hmm. They're actually blessed. Was I gone a lot? Yeah, my wife was such a great mother, though. She made up for it. And when I was around, I was really around. I took my, you know, my daughter, daddy dances, and oh, yeah. I took my son on. I take my son. I had my own airplane at the time, and I loved to fly. So I, would, I, I, my kid Garrett would wake up one morning and say, "Okay, Dad, I gotta go." So I said, "No, you're not going to school today." Hmm what now nah, we're going to jump on my plane to fly out to Wyoming and go fly fishing. I would snatch my kid out of school for five days and take him fly fishing because nice. I'm absolutely confident that those five days with his dad fly fishing in the mountains of Wyoming is way more valuable. Than whatever crap he would have learned in school. Yeah, I agree. Five days. I agree. I, I just said, took my trouble. I said, I'll yeah. handle the trouble. That's what dads yeah. do. I just recently, I did something similar. I have, I have four kids. I have two boys, two girls, and, uh, and I got them all the time. And, and, uh, my, uh, I took my two boys down to LA. You may, some people may not think this is a good idea. They're 16 and 10, but I took them to see two Metallica shows and then took them to Disneyland. And that was just like the valuable time with them. And they thought yeah. Disneyland was the most normal of the two, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my son, my son's a guitar player. He plays, he, and he's a, you know, he he's in honor choirs and all that at his school, and he's a he's a pretty big singer, and so he really, you know, he loves all all the music. Anytime I can take him to a concert, he'll go. And I'm a Metallica fan, so we we went down there, and but yeah, it was just cool to to have that time with them, and it made me realize how little time we really have. My son's a senior in high school. He's gone next year. And it just feels like I blinked, you know? And, and I, the reason I ask these questions is because as an attorney, I'm working long hours, you know? Yeah. And, and the next thing, you know, I, I, I look around and I go, man, he's gone, he's a year and then he's going on a mission. And then, you know, all these kids are going to be gone and it just, just make the time you had to have count. That's all that matters. And by the way, yeah. I, I know you, I've, I've, brother, I've been down that road. I know exactly how you feel. You got about four syllables out. I already knew how you were feeling. And here's the good news, because there is good news. Um, you stay close. If you're close now, even though it may be a little bit of distance, it may be a little different, but it's my son and I are so close, and as as is my daughter and I, and, and mm -hmm. they're close with my wife. We're best of friends. And yeah. that's not because of how much time, certainly in my case, I got to spend with them. It's because of the quality of the time I spent with them. That's yeah. what matters. Yeah, that's awesome. Let me ask you a couple more questions about the wrestling. Is is there, I have to admit, as a guy who was a lifelong wrestling fan, there had to be a few, like, you know, what we call mark out moments. Is there one in particular where you just look, you're, you're just sitting there and you're going, this is, it doesn't get much better than this. I never thought in the I didn't. I never thought in terms of it doesn't get better than this because everything can always be better. Just it wouldn't wouldn't be a thought in my mind. But there were times, several, probably too many to recall. I'd have to think about it and put them in order. Where I went, I can't believe this is really happening to me. Mm -hmm. I I can't believe I am this fortunate to experience this moment. Yeah. 
you know, getting to become friends with Muhammad Ali is one of those moments. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I met Muhammad Ali. Uh, we brought him in to do a pay-per-view in Detroit. I think it was in 93 or 94 or whatever. <clears throat> and I got to meet him. And, you know, I was a huge fan of Muhammad Ali. And as a kid growing up, you know, I listened to Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier fight on the radio with my dad in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it goes back a minute. And here I am, you know, doing business with Muhammad Ali. And that, that left a big impression on me. And then in 1995, my strategic business partners in Japan knew that I had done business with Muhammad Ali, knew that I had a relationship with him or at least could get to him. And they called me and asked me if I would broker a meeting between Muhammad Ali and Antonio Inoki. And if you remember, Antonio Inoki and Muhammad Ali actually had a shoot fight back in 1973, yeah. I think it was. Right. But, but Inoki had lost contact with Muhammad Ali and vice versa. So Inoki, who was my strategic business partner at the time, he didn't know how, he knew I could put the deal together and he didn't know how. So, or he asked me to do it. So I went through a channel or two, got a hold of Muhammad Ali, set that meeting up, got everybody together in Denver. It was very, just a social meeting, it wasn't a business meeting, just purely social. Got everybody together and we had a great time and had a couple of drinks and, took some pictures and everybody went their separate ways. 1995, I get a call from, again, Antonio Inoki, my strategic business partner in Japan, and said, hey, would you be able to contact Muhammad and ask him if he'd be willing to come over to Tokyo for an event and then go on to Pyongyang, North Korea? Mm -hmm. For what it, Antonio Inoki was promoting, along with the North Korean government at the time, Kim mm -hmm. Jong-il. Wow. We're promoting what they called the Peace Festival, which was a two-night wrestling event in a soccer stadium in downtown Pyongyang, North Korea. So I called. By this point, I had enough of a relationship with Muhammad where I could – I actually went through his wife, Lonnie, because Muhammad had a hard time talking on the phone. He could only speak in a whisper. So I, with Muhammad but Lonnie on the phone, said, here's – basically said, here's the opportunity – I didn't think they'd be interested, but when I laid it out, Muhammad couldn't wait to do it. Wow. He wanted to go to North Korea because if you know anything or read anything or choose to read or learn anything about Muhammad Ali, he was a very enlightened guy. Yeah. He had a different view of the world and he believed in bringing people together. And if he could bring people together through his presence in boxing, he'd do it. Yeah. So I ended up flying over to Pyongyang, North Korea from Tokyo on a military, North Korean military transport, no less, which was a trip in itself. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting right next to Muhammad Ali and Muhammad at the time, he couldn't speak like you and I are. He could, he could only whisper because when he whispered, he could, he could enunciate. But when he tried to talk, his vocal cords wouldn't let him articulate. Mm -hmm. So he had to whisper in my ear on a North Korean transport for three hours. And he told me about it. as a young kid, he was growing up in Louisville and he would go to watch professional wrestling when he was mm. eight, nine, 10 years old, whatever he was. And gorgeous George, who at the time was this very flamboyant, effeminate, over the top, bad guy, like super heel that he watched gorgeous George and it left such a strong impression. Now, he's telling me this in his own words. I'm saying it differently. But it left such a big impression upon him that young Cassius Clay, who turned into Cassius Clay, the professional boxer, decided before he became Muhammad Ali to take on that gorgeous George persona in all of his interviews and promos. And that's what made Muhammad Ali famous. Right. That's what made him the biggest box office draw in professional boxing during the sixties was that coming out and telling everybody I'm so pretty. I'm so pretty. <laughs> oh my God. That, that was gorgeous George. Yeah. And to have Muhammad Ali whispering this in my ear and a North Korean military transport plane on the way to Pyongyang, North Korea, Whereas I found out shortly after we landed, I was only one of seven Americans ever to step foot in North Korea since the North Korean War that hadn't been shot down or captured. Wow. 
That was my greeting. <laughs> Korea. And guess what? You're going to be the seventh guy here from America that we had neither shot down or captured. So mind yourself. <laughs> mind your business. <laughs> that, so, that was a, that, and it wasn't a moment. It was obviously a, a window of time. But while that window of time, while I was living in that window of time, I was going, how, how did this happen? Yeah. How did this kid from a crappy little part of East Detroit that then I went to college, but all I did was party and do stupid stuff. Um, with no, no, no business education, you know, no formal training. I never even wanted to be in the wrestling business. It just kind of happened by coincidence. Yeah. And I'm sitting here with Muhammad Ali in a North Korean military transport. And he's whispering in my ear, how he became Cassius Clay. That's pretty cool. That is, that is an amazing story. I, I think that's, that's just, that's just so awesome to think, you know, you never know where your life is going to end up. And so I bet there's one of, one of those moments where you're like, you know, you just, you just pinch yourself, you know, you're like, this has to be a dream. But you know what the value is? The vet was, as I analyze it, the value is I am so glad that I wasn't afraid to put myself in situations that I should not be in. Yeah. I, you know, I could have easily said when Vern Gagne said, Hey, you want to, you know, come to work. And by the way, I would have taken, I took a cut in pay. I was probably at that time, 26, 27 years old. This is back in their early eighties, late seventies, early eighties. I'm probably making 30 grand a year, which wasn't bad money back then. Single, no, no, mm -hmm. you know, no bills, no debt, no nothing. And I went to work for, no, I was making more than I was making about 45 and I went to work for Vern for $600 a week. Cash under the table. So, of course, I didn't take taxes out, which came back and bit me in the butt later. It's one of those things you learn about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, man, you know, that's the, that's the point, though, right, is that you have to. I try to tell my son this all the time because, you know, he wants to be a rock star. And I go, hey, you got to take risks. Don't let me tell you that you can't do it. You know, you got to, you know, don't let anyone tell you. you, got, you before you have all the responsibilities, take all the chances you can, you know, and, and, and maybe one will hit you know so that's, or, or maybe uh, it leads to something else that hits even better oh yeah that's you know, so we have true a, we have a family friend that's a backup singer for um she's on the voice she's actually in charge of all the backup singers on the voice oh wow yeah and uh she, was her dream to be a rock star in music of course does she have the voice to do it absolutely she backs up blake shelton she tours with blake shelton she's got an amazing voice but she's never going to well, I shouldn't say that. She may never be that star, but she has an amazingly successful life that's very fulfilling to her. Was it what she wanted to do or planned to do? Nope. But did it turn out to be a great thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, too. You know, I, I, I question, we talked about failure a lot here. I question failure. Like, for example, I thought when I was going to be a pro wrestler, I was going to be in WrestleMania. You know, I'm six foot seven, 285. So it's oh. like, yeah. So, I mean, you can't tell on the video, but I'm a big guy, you know? And so, I thought for sure I was like, oh yeah, I'll be I'll be in the WWE two in the world two in the world, and it didn't work out. But I'll tell you what, I had a lot of fun on the indie series series, and then I ended up buying a ring and doing some shows. I ended up actually, you may not know this, but on a tour with W uh, with Impact when Impact came to the West Coast, Bob Rosen was the ring guy. He used my ring on the West Coast shows, so it was like I got to work with all these guys and do all these really cool things. I got to bring my son. So did I make the WWE? No. Did I have a lot of fun and have a lot of cool stories? Yes. You know what I mean? I don't think and, that's a failure And at beyond all. that, are you way better off being a trial attorney than you would have been <laughs> a wrestler? You, that yeah. in, in, the, in the real world, statistically, had about one-tenth of one percent chance of actually making a career out of it? Mm -hmm. Because that's, I mean, the odds are so slim. Yeah. You well, know, and, on, and, and on top of that, think about all of the, I mean, you know, some of the guys I'm sure that you've kept in contact with, lots of aches and pains, lots oh, of different issues. Yeah. I just, right before we got on here to do this, I watched uh, an interview that Joe Rogan just did with Kurt Angle. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and Kurt's a good friend of mine. And I've worked with Kurt a lot. I worked with Kurt mm -hmm. in WWE and I worked with Kurt in TNA. Mm -hmm. And I was aware, I thought I was, of what Kurt was going through. But, man, the pain the addiction to drugs, opiates in particular, uh, because he had doctors prescribing it like candy. And yeah. He became desperate and did it. Mm -hmm. 
whew, man, there's a lot of guys that right now that are my, I'm 68 years old and I, there's nothing wrong with me. Mm-hmm. I can go out and run to the end of my driveway. I'll be winded, you know, and I'll be mad right. at myself for being out of right. shape, but like all my stuff works, my joints, yeah. I have an ache. I have to go see a chiropractor. I'm not on any medications. And just being able to say that makes me feel so good. Cause I see so many people that I've worked with for 30 years that wish they were where I am right now. Yeah. Someone like me in terms yeah. of my physical shape, it takes yeah. such a toll, especially when you're big, like you are. It's yeah. different when you're 135, 140 pounds. Yeah. 160 yeah. pounds, 180 pounds. Yeah. You start tipping 230, 240, and that impact starts moving cartilage and ligaments and joints yeah. and chipping stuff. And you don't feel it. You're young. You can numb mm-hmm. it. You can ignore it. You can medicate it until you're about 50 and all that stuff comes knocking on your door. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a concern. I keep telling uh, everybody around me when they talk, because I'm in pretty good shape. I mean, I do, I, I go to the gym six days a week, and I do my cardio and all that, and and all that, but I tell them, I go, you don't see a lot of six foot seven, 85 year olds, you know? And uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I still squat, and I do it because I want to be able to get off the toilet at 70. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you so, know, you listen to some guys that are really, really, you know, thinking about longevity and life extension and things like that. There, you know, keep your keep your core, keep your legs. Yeah. Because if you, you if you lose your legs, everything else shuts down. Oh, That's it. Because yeah. you can't yeah. burn calories. You can't. You know, you yeah. fall down, you break a hip. You got probably six months to live on average if you're <laughs> over sixty five years old. I mean, there's a lot of stuff goes wrong when you lose your legs. So it's a good move. Have you ever tried cryotherapy yet? I haven't. I've heard a lot of good things about it though. Dude, I was in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago for an appearance. And one of the guys that was a sponsor of the parents owns a cryotherapy uh, studio in Buckhead in Atlanta, which is kind of an upscale area. Yeah. So we said, come on in a little early. I'll take you down. You can do a cryotherapy session. I went, eh, yeah. maybe, I don't know. Don't really care too much about it, but eh. anyway, got there that day and I didn't have anything better to do. I was kind of bored. So I go, oh, okay, I'll go try it. Cynical. Didn't really think it eh, just didn't start as another gimmick. I went into this chamber. It went up to my neck, uh-huh. closes up. This girl's on the outside. She pushes a button. There's a timer and all kinds of information up there. It went down to minus 328 degrees. Okay. And I stood in this chamber at minus 328 degrees for three minutes. So she's talking to me the first couple of minutes, you know, and I'm, she says, now you got to turn. You got to, it's like, you got to be your own rotisserie chicken. You know, you get it <laughs> so she's talking to me while I'm turning, you know, it's kind of awkward, but uh, she goes, are you feeling it yet? Are you feeling it yet? I'm going, yeah, I can start. You know, I feel a little, my fingertips a little bit, my elbows, you know, where there's no fat, no tissue. Sure. It sure. starts to tingle a little bit and burn. Um, not, not bad, but a little bit. And we're carrying on this conversation. She goes, I can't believe you could, you're not complaining about that. I said, I, I lived in Minnesota for 20 years. Yeah, right. You, you know, it's just you like know walking to the bus stop in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I got out of there. It was only three minutes. It wasn't that uncomfortable. I got out of there and I, I went, huh, my legs feel awesome. Wow. Oh, I think I'm a half inch taller. I'm standing up straighter. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. And I felt like I could go jog five miles after I I'll got out of that it. thing. I'll have to give that a shot. Yeah, It's worth yeah. a shot. And if you read into the biology of it or the physiology of it, it all makes sense. Yeah. All makes that's, sense. Especially yeah. for someone like you that's weightlifting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. Today was leg day and I'm, I'm feeling it. So I might need some car. <laughs> I did. I did a bunch of squats today. So it's a it's a rough one, but I have to give that a shot. I know some of the local indie guys that do it and swear by it, so I'll give that a shot. What's next for you? I mean, you're obviously a very successful person, goal oriented. You have to be to be as successful as you've been. What what are you gonna do now? I don't know. <laughs> you, you you don't have, you don't have any 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 thoughts or projects that you're. That you're no, no, I do. I do. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. You know, I, I have fun with my podcasts. You know, I've been doing it now for five and a half years. It's probably one of the top rated podcasts. I have about 200 wrestling podcasts in the United yeah. States and around the world. Uh, it, it's been very successful. So I, and, but I enjoy doing that. Yeah. Um, 
I've got a game, a digital collectible card game that I've been developing with a gentleman by the name of Tom DeShane. Hmm. Uh, we've been working on that for a couple of years and we've got some extremely exciting um, discussions going on with some major players in that world. Awesome. So that's kind of fun. And, and I've got to learn a lot because it's something mm-hmm. I never played a video game in my life. So right. I, I, I get to <laughs> learn on the job once again. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I do appearances. I'm I'm leaving here tomorrow, no, mm. day after tomorrow, and I'm heading to uh, London, Ireland. I've got a couple. I've got a date in London, a couple dates in Ireland, Belfast, Northern Ireland, Edinburgh, um, a couple more, I guess, in there. So I'm doing a tour, a live tour in Europe mm. next week, and then my wife and I are going to spend an extra six or eight days just jumping trains and looking at castles and finding pubs. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Haggis. I can't wait to yeah. try Haggis. I, <laughs> yeah, I bet. I've yeah, had people tell me about it. It sounds disgusting, but I'm going to give it a whirl. Yeah. What did they say on that movie? So murder and axe murder. I think most of Scottish uh, cuisine was uh, based on a dare. <laughs> yes, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, well, that's awesome. I mean, it's great to think that like you, you're still now able to go and it's just as interesting to talk about these things years later and also that you're still developing new things. I think that's important even as you get older to just keep reinventing yourself and, and keep, uh, keep active. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. Yeah. I don't know if it's because it's a necessity, you know, because mm-hmm. the bills keep coming just because you turned 65 <laughs> years old. doesn't mean everybody goes up. Oh, it's his birthday today. We're not going to send him these bills anymore. So the bills keep coming and I've done a good job of, you know, making sure the bills keep coming. Yeah. But, but even if that weren't the case, seriously, I, I get bored freaking fast. I like if I don't have something to do. I am my own worst enemy. Yeah. I need projects. I need to be learning something this October. I'm taking a, a, a course from MIT um, <laughs> on, on artificial intelligence interesting just because yeah. i have to know how this stuff works yeah it's like, crazy do you right? have a microwave do i have a microwave yes oh sure yeah do you know how it works and uh, not a, not a clue <laughs> i don't want to be you yeah. there's this thing called artificial <laughs> intelligence out there and if somebody comes up to me and says hey do you know how it works i don't want to be that guy that says i don't have a clue yeah. so i'm taking a class it's an online class at MIT, and they've got a business school. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, MIT Sloan Business School. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm taking a 16 week class to learn about AI and its applications. Nice. Because if I don't, I'm going to feel like that old guy sitting on a porch drinking a warm <laughs> beer. Back in my day, we didn't have this fancy AI stuff. Yeah, I don't want to <laughs> be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. Oh man, that's awesome. Well, listen, I, I appreciate you giving me the time, you know, and you've given me more time than, than, uh, than, than I expected. Let me just ask you one last question that I ask everybody. We've kind of gone over successes and failures and stuff. Um, everybody one day is going to pass away. And when they do, there's going to be a funeral. I'm sure yours will be well attended. And when it happens, uh, someone's going to give a eulogy. What do you think the one thing would be that you hope someone says about you and your eulogy? Hmm. I've never thought about that. I've never thought about that. I I would hope that there's at least a handful of people whose lives I made incrementally better. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. If I did that, that's good. Yeah. But I got this idea for some theme music. I have thought about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What are you going to do? What's your theme music? I, I, I have it on my playlist. I, I play it, but I don't want to get it deleted off YouTube or whatever. But <laughs> it's called Saturday Nights are, are Saturdays are for Celebration by Big Crit. It's a hip hop okay. song. Oh, yeah. Big K R I T. Yeah. Sat- Saturdays are for Celebration. And. Yes. Yeah, if any of your listeners go to it, they'll they'll actually get it. But uh, so yeah, that's, whatever the eulogy is when it's over, I want somebody to hit the button and play that song. That's awesome. 
That's awesome. I, I put, I did an estate plan with a friend of mine and he put a little area where he, where he said, you can put what you want in your funeral. And unfortunately I learned that uh, Viking funerals are illegal. So <laughs> <laughs> I got mine so, figured out. I did the same thing and I want my ashes um, over at a lake where uh, I usually take my dog every morning. We jump in her truck, her truck. It's not my truck. It's her truck. Yeah. It's called yeah. 1995 uh, GMC 2500. It's a, it's a ranch truck. You know, my wife won't even walk by it. It's so filthy. <laughs> my dog loves that truck. So we jump in the truck and we go to this beautiful lake about 15, 20 minutes from my house. And we always have it to ourselves. And we go down to that lake and we just, uh, I talk to God. She chases rabbits. and We have a great time. So I, I told my wife, I said, that's my ashes need to go there because that's where I'm pretty happy. That's awesome. I, I think it's great that you take a day, take some time every day to talk to God, meditate, and I'm sure that centers you quite. That's my church, brother. I don't go to a regular church. I just yeah never do my thing, but I talk to God every day. Awesome. Well, I I want to say in closing, thank you for your contributions to something that I'm very passionate about, and in um, I, I really do appreciate what you did especially my i was a hulkamaniac and you assisting hulk hogan and extending his career by about 15 years by going back <laughs> like you did that really uh that was a big part of me and my friends and now my kids too they're wrestling fans i took them to wrestlemania this last year and just seeing all four of my kids just falling in love with the same thing i did it's really special and you had you played a big role in that and i and i so i really appreciate that uh, so tell everybody, you know, there's wrestling fans here who I know know how to find you, but there's going to be people who aren't, who are going to listen to this. If they want to learn more about you, where's the best places to find you? Um, Twitter at E Bischoff. Of course, my wrestling uh, podcast, 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff, wherever you get your favorite podcast. I don't really play on Instagram too much. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's it. All right. Well, for everybody who's listened, I want to say thank you uh, for one year of fun. We got a lot of more, a lot more uh, uh, cool stuff coming up. I got people coming to talk about the Wizard of Oz. I got other wrestlers coming on. I've got other actors coming on. Uh, I'm hoping the SAG strike ends so they can actually start talking about their projects. Um, other than that, uh, keep listening and thanks for uh, thanks for listening. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, brother. It was a great show. I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.